Hi, what's up, what's up, what's up, Brazilian stars? We have a mental health special for you. In today's video, you will learn three types of mental health support in schools. Our RLRG specialized support and role of psychiatrists, you know, what sets them apart with some insights from Dr. Gerard Hutchinson. So let's break this down into a case study about Paul. Paul is 13 years old. He attends junior high school. Paul moved from Florida to Newark, New Jersey. His mom passed away and his dad was left to care for three children. His dad works several jobs to provide for the family. Paul was on the honor roll in Florida, but he is struggling now. Paul has support in his school. His teachers observed that he was withdrawing, becoming more quiet and not participating in class. He referred Paul to the school counselor. Here we have three types of mental health support in schools really based on the differences. They all provide mental health support, but the key differences lie in training as well as licensure. So the school counselor would help Paul to identify what he liked to be when he's older, focus on his on supporting him with his profession, starting with the end in mind and developing a plan to help Paul get back on track with his, with his academic work. The school social worker may get involved when you know, they realize that perhaps dad is struggling to support Paul within the household uh, because he's exhausted. He's working three jobs to take care of his family. He has three children. And, uh, and the demands may affect his ability to support Paul. And so the social worker may help to connect that to organizations. For example, in New Jersey, we have programs for parents, for children, uh, you know, zero to eight years old, as well as other resources. If Paul continues to struggle with regard to his academic uh, work, a school psychologist may have to be called in to provide Paul with assessments that target his uh, academic achievements, as well as helps him to understand if there are any other things affecting his ability to learn. All of these supports are put in place to help develop Paul's, uh, what is, you know, Paul's plan or intervention plan. And this plan gives Paul the support, not only from the counselors, but from the entire school to ensure that he achieves his academic potential as well as his social and emotional potential. The reality is, however, that we have a high demand, uh, particularly post, you know, pandemic, the pandemic period, we have a high demand of uh, students needing mental health support and a low supply of mental health specialists within the schools. In some cases, we have school counselors who are outnumbered one school counselor to 300 students. So can you imagine what their day-to-day is like trying to facilitate groups, trying to conduct assessments, trying to support the goals of administration? It's, uh, it, could, it could be very, very challenging. Now, what if Paul was just, you know, even, even with the level of interventions he received from the school counselor, the support from the school social worker, the support from the school psychologist who could assist with diagnosing, but is unable to, unless in some states, unless 
that person is a license to um, provide medication, a psychiatrist may have to get involved to help Paul, um, you know, get an assessment, a diagnosis, and in some cases, medication monitoring. It's very important for parents to know that it's not a matter of a psychiatrist just prescribing medication and you know that that's it it's final no parents play an active role in uh, in um, observing their children and how the medication is impacting them and then being able to communicate their observations to the psychiatrist who would be able to make adjustments to the medications you know i've heard um horror stories air quotes uh, by families over the years of um, facilitating the Resilient Stars programs, and they are pretty much afraid of uh, their children getting medication support because of bad experiences that they have had with medication themselves. And I encourage them not to let a negative experience, you know, really. Um, cast a shadow over their decisions concerning their children now you know they 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 things have changed a lot and they're still changing in mental health where is a there's a lot more communication because the consumer the clients the, the patients they are more knowledgeable of mental health of medications and so a dialogue could take place between the provider, the psychiatrist, or the psychiatric nurse, and the parents of the child to advocate to say, hey, you know, this medication is making my child too sleepy, or, you know, um, my child is gaining a lot of weight, right? So these are some changes that we want to observe and note and schedule an appointment to have the medication adjusted as well as to have regular blood tests to make sure that you know the liver is not being affected and really just being responsible and accountable with the provider with the psychiatrist right and so the goal is to ensure that paul gets the support that he needs to strengthen his resilience to cope with any vulnerabilities to mental health According to the statistics, we have one in every five people in the United States of America who can develop a mental health condition or who is already struggling with a mental health condition. So it's definitely not something to avoid. It's something to just build, to build the, to build the resilience and minimize the vulnerabilities to mental health. Next, we have a clip from discussions with Dr. Gerard Hutchinson. He's a psychiatrist and a clinical researcher, and he is discussing the, what differentiates psychiatrists, and his ideas could resonate with all of us as professionals. This is a very casual interview or conversation that we were having that, you know, I thought would be nice for us to just think about. It's related to your willingness to engage in, in the process. And some would argue that it's a lot of work to, you know, kind of be on top of all the medication and the, you know, the biology of mental health problems and also to engage the psychology of it. So they would, um, you know, kind of walk at having to do that. But um, there are a few who have and do.
And so we are committed to the process of supporting school counselors, teachers, parents, and students, you know, in our process at RLRG. And we specialize in understanding the data, our, our psychometric data that looks at students' resources, you know, what helps them to be driven, uh, what help, how do they feel about themselves, their worst, as well as their risks, you know, um, do they report any anxiety or depression and understanding their pains, what, what, what exactly do those uh, scores mean and what would they like to gain at the end of the program? We work as a team. All of us are working as a team in support of the Pauls and their families because we look at, at, we see mental health as being uh, very dynamic in nature and all the, the data could do is to really inform us on how to support the students. When we understand their pains and what they would like to gain, we are able to help them identify and refocus their feelings. Right, so during our program, every single program starts with the student identifying their feelings, rating their feelings, as well as if those feelings are negative, they learn how to recognize that they can shift those feelings. And that's a very, very powerful thing for a child to learn to do, to recognize that they can do. Next, we learn how they learn, sorry, they learn how to connect better with friends, parents, and teachers. So when a child is struggling with, you know, big emotions or even behaviorally, in what we practice, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a belief that there are some core beliefs that are running programs for these children mental programs and these core beliefs are unhelpful in nature they typically fall under three categories one feeling unworthy feeling unloved and feeling bad or worthless and these programs are so powerful because the, the child believes these programs and these programs are reinforced by environmental messages. For example, a parent feeling stressed out and telling the child you're, you're going to amount to nothing if you keep your behavior up. Or a parent saying you're lazy when a child is really struggling with depression. Or a teacher you know, telling the child you're just going to amount to nothing or you're going to fail. See, the child believes this already. They believe that they're bad, they're not good enough, and they then act in, in ways to get that feedback from the environment. See, there's proof that they're not good enough. Their automatic thoughts are negative when they assess a situation. They assess the situation based from the premise that they're not good enough or they can't cope with this. Those thoughts then fuel feelings of frustration and anger, which tend to fuel behaviors that are unhelpful to them building supportive relationships because people feel bothered by them. They don't want to engage with them, not recognizing that the, the child is struggling between really wanting to, to, for lack of a better word, fit in and not being able to do so because they're not reading the room, they're not self they don't have that self-awareness developed yet and they're not they don't have empathy to be able to recognize when other people are frustrated and how to respond to that and so our program helps them to participate in role plays to build their confidence and to 
then exercise their strengths in the real here and now with their classrooms, their classmates, their parents and their teachers. And to see them uh, flourish is just the, the best part of this work. So our students feel better, they learn more and they achieve greater. This brings us to the end of our special mental health presentation for the Resilient Stars program. You know, we discussed the supports that are available to students like Paul from our school counselors, our school social workers, our school psychologists, our psychiatrists, as well as the specialized support offered by the Resilient the Resilient Stars program through the Robinson Lloyd Resiliency Group. Thanks for watching. We encourage you to share, to subscribe, and to leave comments. We want to hear your thoughts. And until next time, thanks for watching.